Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. I talked to an artist on today's show, a painter based in New York. And uh, one of the things they do is they paint, they do very large paintings. And we talk while they're in their, uh, their studio space. But we find out during the discussion, or at least I find out during the discussion, they already knew this because they said it and it's their life. But I find out that they're teaching, but not only are they teaching, they're teaching a class about how to make their own paint, but it's based on the physics of the paint. It's based on like the the creative buildup of the paint. Creative buildup? That makes it sound like it's plaque or something. But no, like the, the the stuff that makes paint and how it's created. And we actually, it's fascinating and they're really passionate about it and just fascinated with the knowledge of it. And we, I, I'm, we just have this discussion about how paint is created in different colors and the makeup of them and all that. And I found that fascinating. It was really cool to kind of hear this discussion. So we talk about that for a little while. We also talk about the benefit of communities, them living in New York in a larger art, art community uh, that is all also passionate about what they do. And there are just so many other people to create word of mouth. And uh, the difference between that and say, maybe, you know, uh, the Midwest scene where there are passionate people, but the population density just isn't as much. So it's, it's just a different sort of feel of how the word gets around. I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking more about it. When we discuss it, I'm trying to figure out how to make that difference here. And I think I'm doing it while I'm explaining this now. Anyway, it was a delightful conversation. Had a great time. And here it is, the interview starting right now. My name is Estefania, Estefania Velez Rodriguez. If you're Hispanic, it's Estefania. I also go by SD or S. Um, and where am I from? That's such a good question. I'm from kind of everywhere, okay. but I was born. I know I'm just like, here we go. Let's go on a, a journey. Yeah. Um, I was born in Mayaguez in Puerto Rico. Um, and then we moved to Michigan, which why that's like so cold. Why did my family do that? Hey, I'm in Wisconsin. Then, what, what do we... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it, but I'm from. A no, I don't love it. I'm kidding. Water. I hate winter. I, do, oh, I, <laughs> I love when it snows. Oh, no, 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 no. I know it's so beautiful. It's not fun <laughs> to clean it up, but it's beautiful to see it as it falls. Um, yeah. So we were in Michigan for a little bit. Then we moved to Florida and then I came to New York in 2015 for graduate school. And that's okay. where I've been since. And when was that? Yeah. When did you go to graduate school? Uh, 2015 to 2017 um, here in uh, New York, in Brooklyn. Okay. So I went to uh, Brooklyn College, which is part of the CUNY, the city of New York um, school. And so I also took courses with the MFA students at Hunter College because they're part of the same program, which right. is kind of fun. Now, yeah. what were you? Uh, what type of stuff were you doing in graduate school? Were you already painting then, or because it's yes, always interesting? Yes. Okay, because a lot of people I talk to like painting will be something they eventually did. But I and I do know from looking at your stuff, you have different types of things that you do. So I was curious what your main focus was. So what what was your main focus? Yeah, so I am a painter, or I have a master's in painting. Mm -hmm. um, I also have done like uh, video work. Um, I have also done like kind of, yeah, just performative video things yeah. and drawings. Um, there's a professor named Jennifer McCoy, who she's part of a artist duo with her husband. So it's Jennifer McCoy and Kevin McCoy, and they're really cool. Um, they're the ones that started, um, uh, no, no, no. Oh my gosh, I'm going to forget. The NFTs. NFTs. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> they started them? Yeah, like they're they're like the ones. They're like huh. the ones. Okay. Yeah, they're they're like really big. That's funny. I never th it, and it's not that uncommon, but it's like one of those things you hear about and you never really think of, well, who came up with that idea? It's just all of a sudden one day NFTs was there and the main thing I needed to do was what is that? How how does that work? I, I didn't even think about totally. like who, who made it. It's like how eventually things like Twitter or whatever, you're like, oh, wait, that person made it. Like, that's right. It didn't just pop up on the Internet one day magically. 
<laughs> right. I know. I also don't think about that either. Like, where did this come from? Like, yeah. I don't know. Huh. Um, I'd be curious to no, know how that like, all began. That's weird. Okay. You should totally check out their work. They're like very, very, very cool. Okay. Um, and thinking about NFTs too, this is maybe like very sidelined, but huh? I've seen people like I've sometimes Googled my own name just to see like what comes up. Oh, yeah. And I've seen people like stealing my image oh and then like using it like i've seen people like selling cups and t-shirts of my work okay and with my name it's like and it, i'll have like a new like a new title it'll be like rainforest huh. <laughs> by estefania velez rodriguez and i'm like what like so thinking about these nfts like i think they're really cool but also like with technology and the way that we like publicize ourselves on instagram or like mm -hmm. social media or websites like people can basically also just take your images and make them into like digital right it's the, work well and it's the thing that it's considered valuable because that actually does accrue value i mean this is my you know my uh, what would it be armchair quarterback version of what i know of M nfts but the thing being from what you're talking about it's the whole like people can not only sell it but they can sell it to people as an original work that's that's the confusing part like it's it, it, nft mm -hmm. from my understanding of it i feel like gets confused with copyright like people saying this is how you can own your work because you create an nft out of it and then it becomes valued because it's linked to that blockchain and again, this is me just generalizing the brief time that I looked up because I was just like, all right, this is too much work. I have other things I could be doing, you know, studying it uh, right. if I were involved in it more. But yeah, that, and then somebody doing that, it's like, well, that disproves the theory. That's just somebody hijacking it. That's like stealing a Van Gogh from a museum and then walking out and right. going, hey, look at this painting I did. Instead of just stealing it and selling it like a criminal, you're going like, hey, look this what I mine. made. This is mine now. And I mean, that's copyright in general, but with the NFT, it's like saying, no, we certify, it, it, it makes it seem like someone's certifying that this is 100% in fact, real and original and all that. And that's, what's difficult. Like me, the worst thing that's ever happened is somebody took one of the drawings I did and made a shirt out of it and uh, considered <gasps> it was their own. Nobody bought oh, it. No. I mean, I was able to look I, cause I did the same thing, Googling myself and I was Googling an image that I drew that I was specifically trying to market. And somebody did a print on demand shirt of it. And I looked at it and I'm like, well, I tried to do that too. And they were selling it for twice the price I did. And I was like, nobody bought the one I did. So they're not going to buy it <laughs> at twice Actually, the price by this person. I bet you they would. It's yeah? like so weird. Something that I've learned from like the market is like the higher you price something, the more value people believe it has. Yeah. So it's like the opposite. It's like, it's so weird. So it's like, if you sell that shirt for 25 and someone sells it for 50, they'll think it's like worth more and they'll right. buy it for 50, but not for 25, which to me is like counter intuitive. I'm like, no, what, wouldn't you just get the cheaper shirt? But people like <laughs> right. want to, you know, like yeah. they want to be like, I got this fancy $50 t-shirt, you know, that has this cool True. artist's drawing so who knows yeah and it is perceived value yeah it's it, it you're yeah, absolutely totally. right that is a thing for sure um yeah it's i mean that's uh, my entire behind me here that's my entire business model is uh i find old things that people sell at garage sales and estate sales and then go well i went out and found it so it's this i'm not that i'm going like they're hundreds of dollars no but you know they <laughs> i i definitely make a profit on them you know i'll i'll sell them even yeah. though i didn't get them for what i'm selling i mean that's now we're just explaining the economy i mean that's, that's what you know that's what a corner store does <laughs> i mean the the painting world or like the new york painting world is economy like it's yeah. all capital unfortunately or fortunately depending on what your viewers you know how they want to talk about it but it's i think a good conversation yeah. and a good way to also segue it's like the same thing happens for paintings it's like right i was um showing my work at the barclays center for which is a bank a uh, banking system that also has like a huge um uh auditorium where like the new york knicks and like the brooklyn nets and like I don't know if the Knicks play there. Sorry, I know the Nets play there. And also, like, big concerts happen there. So they're just, like, a bank that has a lot of funding. But they had this thing, and they asked um, specific artists to come show their work just for, like, a day. 
And I did that, and they were like, oh, how much is this painting? And somebody said, oh, it should be like 10000 And I was like, actually, it's 5000 And they were offended. Like, they didn't, they thought I was worth less. Like, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, no, this is a podcast that everyone's listening to. I have, like, um, I have no filter. <laughs> no, that's sure quite all right. No, and I, I, I mean, that. I get what you're talking about. It's... It they so they came to where you were and like going, oh, here, I'm going to go find some cheap art or something like that. And the opposite. They were like offended that it was worth that the gallery that sells my work was selling it for less than they thought. Oh, so I was like, hearing it the other way. OK. I, I mean, yeah, and the no. thing is, is both sides work on this story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like they thought it was worth 10, which I, I mean, yes, it is worth 10, but like yeah. it's not selling for 10. So it's like no, it's actually selling for five. And they were like, I could see in their face, they were like, are is there something wrong with it? You know, just like thinking okay. about like, well, this is uh, X amount of size, it's oil, it's represented by, it's an artist that's represented by a Chelsea gallery, like it has to have a certain like pedigree and a certain amount of pricing. Okay. And they, I could see that that was like um, actually an issue. And I was like, whoa, like, um, it's just like good to know. I feel like I've had a lot of like hard, hard lessons or things where I'm like, Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Because as I'm sure, you know, and um, I'm sure other people have spoken about, it's like, there's no rules necessarily. So you're kind of learning um, within the environment. Right. So there's a lot of things that I've done that are for me, my first, and then I have to kind of see the response, like, well, what's the response to this? And I'm very highly, aware or I try to be really aware of how people react to things so that I could learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. And I saw that for them, that was not good to say it was worth less. And I was like, Oh no, I should have just said yes. And then told the gallery, hi. (laughs) Right. Well, and you never you know. know. I mean, that's that's the live and learn thing. You're never going to know right out of the gate. And also if you hadn't had that conversation, you also wouldn't have known. Um, that's true. You know, that's it's so true. you would have yeah. continued doing it. So it's actually good that you were able to experience that and learn from it rather than like, say, three years down the road, realizing like, oh, th- I, I should have fixed that. And sometimes yeah. that is how it goes. I've experienced that part. Yeah. <laughs> realizing totally. like way later. Totally. Um, and so how did you get started painting? Uh, when did you yeah. when did you begin painting? Um more seriously started painting in college and undergrad so I took this course I think it was after my intro to painting I took a painting one or painting two at I went to undergrad in Florida at the University of South Florida um, and I had really good professors there too um, in all all of the departments that were really good but I had a painting professor named Elizabeth Condon who is now like my mentor, someone that I um, definitely like still listen to her advice, although I'm obviously much older and, but I just, I really respect her work. And so she was the first one, honestly, that encouraged me. And so in that painting class, I made this, um, I think the first thing I did was like, we had to make like, it was, um, it was a, a lesson from Yale um, about painting a white napkin in a diorama with red, a red uh, construction paper wall, a blue construction paper wall, and a yellow floor. Okay. And so, like, all the light reflects off of the white tissue um, or paper towel, whatever white, you know, object you put in it. And then you have one light source. So it's like this, like, very um, curated little space to paint. And instead of painting with my brush, no one told me to, I just did all of it with a palette knife. So I just started to like throw it in without the brush and instead use the palette knife. So it was like really chunky, really kind of aggressive, really hard edges, you know, in some areas I tried to like mix it with the palette knife. And so when we came to having the critique, you know, from all the painting, like the young painting students, she's like, what, who did this? Cause obviously it's like anonymous or maybe not obvious to be, sorry, it is anonymous. So you just put up your work. Um, 
I mean, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, people all start to develop their style and you can go, this is anonymous and it'll be like, oh, that's, what's their names, you know? <laughs> totally. That's so true. That is very, very true. You're like, oh no, we know this person. Totally. Yeah. Like if I were in that class to be like, oh, the guy that did the cartoon, that's, that's Tom. Like, you know? That's Tom. <laughs> we all know that's Tom's work. The six foot cartoon. Right. Yeah. So, um, so she's like, who made this crazy like painting and I was like I did and she's like oh uh -huh. whoa okay and then I just kept doing things like I would make something that would take a long time like make a person look realistic and a background realistic and then I would be rushed and be like okay the project is due and then I just like make the face look totally crazy just because it's all the time I had to do it okay yeah but I liked it too but it was just like okay well rendered well rendered smear craziness and she's like who did this and mm -hmm. I was like um I did again and she's like you have a future like you can do this and oh, like nice. once she said that I and because she's so for me she's like very accomplished and she's incredibly intelligent she has like a very big fire about her like a big presence yeah and I knew that she also lived in New York and would travel to Florida to teach us and was kind of like between New York and Florida so I just like really was inspired by her her life I was like oh I would love to be a real a real artist um, and so once she gave me that encouragement, I really, I took it to heart and then I started to really pursue it. And I knew that I wanted to apply for graduate school. I also had a professor named Ezra Johnson in painting who was very helpful. He was, okay. um, I don't know if you know his work. He shows a lot with like Fright and Volume, uh, which is in what neighborhood they moved. They were in like the Lower East Side, but I think the gallery moved to like, oh goodness. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So they're here in New York. <laughs> I was just going to say, I don't know the forever. areas you're talking about anyway. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so never mind. Okay. But he's a really great painter. Um, he was a little bit more like, uh, he just had a different way of teaching. Both, all of my professors were great. Um, but I also learned a lot about him and he was really more, um, he didn't, he wasn't prescriptive. Like he wouldn't tell you what to do and how to do it. He would kind of ask you questions. And then when a student would ask him a question about like, let's say a slideshow about contemporary painters, um, he wouldn't answer it. He would just reflect the question back. So he would say hmm. like, oh, well, what do you think? And since I was younger, I wasn't that much younger, but I was younger than I am now. Yeah. Um, I would think, wow, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> or maybe you were accidentally in like a psychology, a psychology class or something. Right. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why is he not answering this? Like, this is so weird. Does he not know? Right. And then obviously now that I'm like a much, you know, I'm 38 by the way. So like now that I'm like 38 and I've been in it a little bit and teaching myself at different universities like i'm like oh he was just trying to get us to think critically for ourselves instead of giving us this response or giving us an answer or solution he wanted yeah. us to kind of consider the question and answer it and critically think about it but at first i was like this guy doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> right well and it also seems like maybe he was going uh, you just want me to answer these questions for you so you don't have to think about it. So it's like, you know, just sit on it for a second and see what you think. You know, I don't know. That's right, that, right. That's the way I kind of viewed it, too, where it's like, yeah. you know, just think about it. And also yeah. the fact that it's subjective uh, as far as art goes totally. too. you know, saying what's good and what's bad as far as art goes, you know. Absolutely. I was listening to you and um, Peter Schenk. Uh, the podcast that you did a few yeah. weeks ago and I was thinking about like that question about like what do you think is bad art because it was something that you guys talked about mm -hmm. and I was like there is no bad art to me right. like I don't think there is like especially from teaching it's like there's, there's so taste, many different you know there's taste yeah. yeah totally there's taste but it's like I don't know if I could be the authority like oh, right. I don't know if I could be the authority on that you know like there's so much history and there's so many different ways of seeing and it's like how can I think the more that you know about painting or art making in whatever form music opera dancing you know like contemporary dance mm -hmm. like any type of art form writing literature poetry like the more you know about the subject, the more there's space, like there's more growth for like what's good or what's accepted. Yeah. 
And I, I really think about that a lot. It's like the students think, like the younger students think that anything that's not realistic is terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like seeing them kind of understand these lessons, like even like figure ground reversals, right? Which are like not very hard necessarily, but to do them, they're really hard to like conceptually get there as a drawing. Yeah. And then you see their minds just expand. You you literally see them grow. And it's like, wow, this is just so cool. Like, and as they get, as people, all humans get taught, like, these new ways of thinking or perceiving the world, the more they're open to these other modes of art making. And it's like, if we don't show society what these other modes of thinking can be, the the scope becomes quite narrow right mm -hmm. it's like it's like the scope in a film where it's just like one person and hardly any background like sorry right. this is really close to me but it's like <laughs> this is all you have or like you can be like this is all you have like you know like it's like there's there can be like so much more expansion yeah and you need education for that like Mm -hmm. And I want to bring up education because of what the Supreme Court did with affirmative action um, within the uh, university system or college system. It's like, I think what we need is like all of us, like I love teaching and I love all students, all everywhere, all the place. I love all people. And it's like the thing that happens in, because I teach in a uh, private university. And I was just going to ask, what are university. you teaching in? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I teach in, um, I'm teaching at Pratt um, okay. Institute. Um, so I'm teaching painting processes, which is uh, basically like the chemical components of painting, teaching how to make your own oh. paint, oh. Um, and all kinds of things. It's super nerdy, and I'm like a huge nerd, so it's perfect for me. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes less about the philosophical perspective and more so about like the tangible, like, what does this chemical do to this chemical? How does a metal make a white, right? Like yeah. what happens in this process or like, what can you, like, how can you stabilize a, a paint depending on the medium? Um, and then I teach junior survey painting um, at Pratt. Um, junior survey painting. At, yeah. So it's just like an eight hour painting intensive and they are just working on getting ready for their senior year and their, uh, thesis show. i mean it's before senior year, it's junior year yeah so it's really you know they go up for a big review in their junior year to see if they'll pass to senior year um which i think is really cool about pratt because i didn't have a, that type of rigorous uh like i wasn't paneled as an undergrad student i okay. was paneled as a as a graduate student in painting so for them to have that experience in undergrad i think that's like very cool yeah, yeah. um but just thinking about like opportunities that public and private sectors um, allow, I guess, like it's very different. Like I have learned a lot from teaching at a private uh, arts institute. Um, I feel like I got a second MFA. Like it was, it's just very rigorous and there's many more opportunities. There's a lot more funding for the students within the classroom. There's a lot of free materials. Okay. There's more machinery, there's more like studio spaces, there's more outside critics coming in and visiting artists. And so like thinking about like public education and private education at the college level, um, it's quite different, although all the students are intelligent. Like no matter where you go to school, like you think absolutely amazing. And intelligence isn't met by education, right? Like you can just be very intelligent and have no proper education. Mm -hmm. But I think like having access, people that usually are public students that don't have access to the private sector and like private education funding um, are equally as intelligent and they just need the opportunity to be there, you know, the scholarship and also just the eyes to see that they have the capacity to also succeed. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, it's so important. And I, I think most of the world would agree with that. And it was just very disappointing to see like some of the things that are happening right now um, in our beautiful country. It's just very like hard because I know it's going to impact a lot of um, 
very bright students that just don't have the same economic positioning to get to get them to that type of education and that type of knowledge um, and those type of facilities mm -hmm. um, and materials. So, sorry, I know this wasn't supposed to be a PSA, but I'm like, by the way, PSA. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, you now, know. Well, and with uh, so you're you're teaching these students, and um, and also yeah. I've had one other person on the show who's actually talked about. Um, uh, viewing some online, not courses, but I guess, well, maybe courses, but videos about people making their own paint. So that's interesting. I've, I've had yeah. one other person that's, that's been interested in that and spoke of them trying to do, I forget what they made it out of, but I want to say it was, I want to say it was, uh, like plants or something. They were learning how to make paint oh, from it yeah. and stuff. So. Yeah, so you can you can make pigments, you can um, make natural pigments. And so it's kind of weird. It's made with alum. So it's a metal. So okay. it's like a metal and it, it's like, it eats away at the um, natural plant. Um, mm. So it's like a, a type of, uh, it's a specific process that you mix with, I think it was um, ammonia. I think it's alum and ammonia. Okay. And then you can add the natural pigment. I have not made my own pigment. I have made my own paint. Okay. I can show you. May, may I show you? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, cool. So like here is like some. So I did not make this, but I will make paint from these different pigments. And so they're already, you know, in this powdered okay. form. And so. This what does is that smell like? Violent. I can't. That's the only thing I can't tell from the video. It smells kind of like rusty. Okay. It's kind of like a rusty metal. Yeah, because my you know? instant thought was that it smelled like grape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was curious. I wanted to know if that was going to hold true. Oh, my god. But gosh. no. Okay, so it smells like this rust. Is, uh, okay. Gatorade purple. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so usually what we'll do then, you know, the company that sells it will give you some type of generic name that they made. So this one's Ultramarine uh, Violet from Kremer. Okay. So Kremer is an art supply store here in New York. But what you can do is you can actually look up the code. Yeah. So this is PR259.77007. So what you can do is PR is just um, the name. So P is for pigment. So PR is pigment red. So oh. if you can read the codes, then you can actually figure out how to make this. Or, or like not make it, sorry. Um, it's a pre-mixed color that a company has made you can figure out a way to make right. it yourself so yeah. then i'd go okay what's pigment red 259 okay so let's say that's like a naphthol red so then i'd go okay 77007 what's that and then it could be like oh it's a naphthol red mixed with an ultramarine blue and maybe titanium or zinc white hmm. you know or you could do that with like um i know you can still hear me i'm coming right yeah <laughs> you can also do like um this is a really great um, paint company that's based in Florida called Marion Street Art Materials. Okay. And so they, they named this Seafoam Sludge. But if I go to the back, it says it has PW6, PV15, PY51. So then I'd go, okay, PW6 is titanium dioxide. Mm. Uh, PV is... I wouldn't which, have done so that. <laughs> I don't know what that yeah. is. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So this is like nerd. It's like super nerdy, but like I love... No, but that's impressive. It. Yeah. it's And it's also available to everyone. So I'm not trying to be like, oh, I know this. Like, right. It's more like, hey, you can also do Well, and this. you're you legitimately like teaching other your... people how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm not like, this is my secret. I'm like, hey, this is what I've learned. <laughs> right. Would you like to also be a nerd? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, that's I awesome. I like that. Yeah. So, okay. Anyways, how, how, so wh what, what made you go off into <laughs> wanting to teach people about that and learning about that? What was, why, why yeah. did you decide that that's something you wanted to, uh, accrue knowledge of? <laughs> yes. So I'm okay. So I think it's very cool. I really am interested in color. Like okay. I love color. I think color is totally insane. It's just crazy like light is like a wave and a particle right yeah. so it's like just thinking about the mechanics and the science of color like color is technically chemistry so you have all these books that relate to color not just as like 
you know, something that you can paint with, but like the chemical properties and like what they do with other things. Like, for example, the naphthol reds are like uh, very um, hydrophilic. No, okay. no, no. Hydrophobic. I apologize. Hydrophobic. Oh. Hydrophobic. I, would, you, so I would not have guessed that you said the wrong word. It's perfectly yeah. fine. Philic <laughs> is love. I love something. And phobic is like, oh, get away. Okay. So that like makes sense. The, the, right? So the naphthol does not want to mix with water. It's hydrophobic. Okay. And so if you add the naphthol red pigment, the powder, and you mix it with any type of liquid, like let's say a walnut oil to make it into oil paint, it won't mix right away. You have to add um, something that will make it hydrophilic. Like you have to add another chemical in order to help it mix. So it's just like, it's so cool. I just think it's so cool. Yeah. And it's also like magic because you're like, okay, if Kinda, I put something yeah. wet, right? Yeah. Like if I put something wet with water it's gonna get wet you know like yeah. it's how you know and so when you like mash it with your molar which is like a glass thing that you mix your paint with to make paint out of mm -hmm. it will unstick itself like it'll take it'll take itself out of the powder which literally feels like a magic trick it's like mm -hmm. where's houdini like how did he do this how is he here his ghost is here you know like how is this happening and so i think it's just like a nerdy love of it and um yeah i don't know i just hmm. i tr personally like i very it's entertaining to me and, yeah you know i, no, just I get think that it's, it's cool. and i get i get your uh you're doing the thing of uh that i've done and all of us have done in the weird thing that we're very obsessed with but realize maybe others aren't <laughs> is that you're telling me this fascinating thing and then instantly apologizing for having this knowledge. You know, <laughs> why do we do that? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, oh no. It's like no, I, I, no, it's very fascinating. And actually the passion that you have for it, it, it makes it, even though half the things you're saying, I have no clue what the background is. And of course I'm not going to right away because I didn't study it. But yeah. the, with the yeah. amount of enthusiasm that you're talking about, it's just like, well, that's fascinating. Holy hell. That's really nice. You know? Yeah. So yeah, no, no, that's, I, I like that. That's really cool that you, that you decided that that was something that interests, well, not even decided, just realized that it was something that interests you. And, uh, yeah, no, that's fascinating. And, and also no. kind of like chemistry. Like, did you do science at all when you were in school? Did you enjoy science? Fun fact. Okay. I, before I realized I'm not that good at it, I, I really love like, physics i think physics is very very cool yeah i am not good at the mathematics when you get that high so i think i got through trig but i couldn't get through pre-calc okay. i had to quit like i couldn't get through it and then i was like i want to be a wetlands scientist i want to help the environment realize i just couldn't do the math like okay. i could do i'm not not that i can't do math like i'm oh i'm okay at it but not to be an actual scientist and so i realized like i couldn't i i just it's i get my, you my brain no just, it's yeah, very I similar it. i enjoyed i enjoyed <laughs> physics too but i enjoyed the theoretical part of it the part would you go yes. what if this caused this and then it's like oh i have to prove it oh okay no the, it, it's it's essentially a creative writing class up into a point and then all of a sudden it has to be well this it's uh, like when you talk about time travel in a book, it's like, well, you have to explain the theory of how this time travel actually works and affects other things because of the time travel. <laughs> it's that, true. Yeah, exactly. That's where I was at. I was like, there's this, um, so there's a few um, physicists that I love. There's a guy named Brian Cox that if you just Google or like YouTube Brian Cox, he's yeah. just like super, super smart. And he's like doing like not earth physics, but, um, you know, astrophysics yeah. or things outside I call of them our space physics, <laughs> space <laughs> physics. No, totally space. <laughs> yeah. Physics. Um, or like Jim Malkalili. Like I was like, I love these books. And then I also got, I'm going to forget his first name, something Gould okay. or gold. I think it's actually your name. I think it's Tom Gold. Okay. And at Pratt, I checked out a book called Taking the Back Off the Watch. And it's a physics book. I and like so that title. when he starts, it's super cool. Yeah. And so he goes through his history and like having to leave Europe at a young age because of World War II and like 
he was just incredibly intelligent and in all of the accolades that he's accomplished. Um, but then he would get into like really specific things that I just could not follow. And I was like, I like it when it's more theoretical and kind of a little bit like, um, I don't know, just like very like almost romantic, you know, these right. ideas about space and ourselves and mm -hmm. we're in this void. But then when he got into like the mechanics of it, I was like, all right, I got to stop reading. I, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> At some point for me, it would just be like, yes, my eyes have been going across each line of words on the page, but I have been thinking about like fruit pies. You know, it's, I'm not thinking about <laughs> totally, anything in particular. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly. just moving my eyes across the page. Um, so, okay. Now, uh, one thing I still want to get into, and this is funny, we're this far into the conversation and I haven't even really asked, uh, I mean, you're doing teaching, you've, you've gone to school for this art, you've had other people recognize your art and things like that. Um, how would you describe it? Like, what would you say the style of it is? Not to, I, I mean, I know that's the most dreaded question in any creative <laughs> field. But, you know, if, if yeah. people had to, especially if they're listening to this, you know, they can't see the paintings that you have in the background and, you know, they can oh, look it up later. True. But how would you explain right. what would you say your style of art is? Yeah, that is kind of the dreaded question. And I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming because I've listened yeah. to your podcast, but I still was like, I don't know. I, I mean, it's very much in the realm of landscape painting um oh. it's absolutely you know they're all uh, very 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 abstracted <laughs> landscapes um and okay. they're from my own photographs of when i go back home to visit my family in puerto rico or go to mexico to visit friends it's very latin american meets like new york um and yeah i use a lot of ideas around like rupturing like space kind of like cubist specifically rupture and also change the per perspective, right? So you have like frontal and then side perspective and then okay. below. So I'm not quite as much as that, but I rupture spaces by patterning. So I'll try to flatten a space by patterning it. And so if the pattern stays the same size of shape, it will come forth okay. uh, to the viewer's eye. Versus if I change the size, it would recede because that's how pointed perspective works. So it'll kind of bring you in. Yeah. And so I'm very, very aware of how I'm manipulating the viewer. So like if something's coming out at you, that's absolutely on purpose. Something's very flat. That's on purpose. But if something brings you in, that's also on purpose. But it's a game I play with myself. I think of the paintings as puzzles. Hmm. And so I try to like. Basically, I try to entertain myself <laughs> while I'm in here, you know? Well, yeah, of well, course. Have, yeah. Yeah. Let me see. I have, um, like, here is this photo of this place in Puerto Rico that is a very old um, cemetery from, like, the Spaniard era. So it's, like, All very right. old. And you can see, like, a crypt right there, like, the circle of the crypt and then the casket would go in there yeah and then because of hurricanes and other things there's debris and so i'll take something like this which has much information and then I'll, I'll kind of start to break it down and try to rupture it so like you can kind of see at the bottom right i think it's okay. your bottom right maybe your bottom left no yeah it's my so, bottom left i see it yeah so then you know i'll start to kind of break the space down as basic shape and then find the light and dark areas and then start to kind of build it in. And then later I will glaze it. So I'll add color, hmm. but very lightly with a lot of oil so that you can kind of see the moves that are uh, below, but it mostly stays pretty um, fairly flat, but there's a lot of like layers. So I have like an imprimatura or like a ground. So I'll put like one color down and then erase my light okay. and then go back over it with more of the color to make it darker. So I'll have like a light, a dark, um, and a, like a mid with just one color by erasing. And then after that, I'll put in a gray or grisaille. So the grisaille is where I add, um, like literal, like opaque, opaque value. And then I'll glaze on top. So mm -hmm. they're coming from like, they're coming from real places that exist and make sense in our brain. And I just try to make it into a puzzle. So I'll, I'll try okay. to kind of 
figure out, well, what do I find important? How do I bring it out to push towards the viewer's eye? What's less important? What would I like to recede? I can also recede things by desaturating them, right? So making them less bright. Um, so I could like change, like let's say I have a very bright purple and I want to make a space next to it recede and I'll mix yellow into it because complements um, basically desaturate the yeah. color. So then it'll become like a dull gray, like a like a gray purple. Okay. Um, and so I kind of, yeah, play this game with myself about like, what do I want to? Sorry for that noise. I apologize. It's okay. It's not that loud. But I did start <laughs> okay, to notice good. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So sorry. So I, my studio is in a very big artist building. It's three stories and it's a huge, like, old factory building. Oh, so nice. There's literally hundreds of artists in here. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. In Brooklyn. I don't know if I've said that before. But yeah. yeah. So it's just like, yeah. So sorry for all the noise. No, that's all right. But yeah, that's basically what I do is I just try to kind of entertain myself and confuse myself and then bring myself back together. And um, I think if somebody sees it without knowing where it came from, they might just think it's simplistic Yeah. because um, the colors are mostly quite saturated. Most of the visual field is quite flat. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you didn't know what it was coming from and how I've purposefully ruptured it and distorted it and, you know, played with it, then it, it, it could lose its charm, which okay. is okay. It could also, you know, not be for everyone. I totally understand that, you know, but they're pretty bright. Um, and they're like very abstracted landscapes. How do you get your work out there? So there's the one thing about making the painting we can all, we can all create, but it's the yes. getting the work out there. And you had talked before about, you know, actually selling your work, and meeting people and we had that whole discussion earlier but how are you getting there how are you how are you yes. actually sharing stuff and being able to put it in places yes i'm going to be super didactic or like prescriptive okay. so that people can just follow a formula no i mean i guess there's not just one formula but i will say that most people in new york one Yes, New York has a lot of opportunities that I haven't personally experienced in other places in the U.S. or in any other country. Like okay. New York City has so much opportunity. So I think that a young or whatever age artist that would like to have a bigger audience, it does help to have some type of like New York relationship even if you don't live here just coming you know, to last meet week I, I spoke with someone last week and it was just kind of like <laughs> it kind of they actually run a gallery and I was like how are you telling people about this gallery because they were also in a place that was kind of tucked away in a factory building and they're like oh, I just mentioned it to someone the end yeah you know and I'm like ah come on <laughs> but what you're saying and I realized that's what it was it's like oh there are other people it's really just word of mouth it's the community sort of built thing and it is true there are I mean New York is a much more populated place uh, with people that also find like-minded. So yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. And I have learned that over the years from talking with people. It is different based on location for sure. Oh yeah. It's just that there's so much capital here. And so like in terms of capital capitalism, like you can't have a gallery without funding. You can't have uh, collectors in your Rolodex without funding. And so unfortunately, what I fortunately or unfortunately what I've learned is that so much of the component of New York that makes it su successful is its its business. It mm -hmm. has Wall Street, you know. It has um, all of the guys in tech. It has like it has financial gravity, and so people have the expenditure to purchase a ten thousand dollar painting for their home. Like there's an audience for it, and there's collectors, and there's also gallerists that have these connections mm -hmm. and the way that we get in as normal people because i'm definitely not a person that you know came from like oh look at all this money like that's yeah. definitely not my, my history Wait, or, you're not you know, why am i doing this interview I'm, I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm sorry tom <laughs> i'll put you in a group show and I'll yeah, there you go <laughs> no but it's true it's like the way that i have found my entrance point is basically from showing my face like it's also very uh, social labor so it's like 
I can't just stay in my studio painting all day. I have to go to openings. I have to right. meet other artists. I have to talk to people. I, I have to show my face and try to like, you know, really make an effort to communicate with others and ask people into my studio or even just to be my friend on Instagram so they could see my work. And, you know, people are quite receptive. And if they don't like your work, that's okay. Cause there's so many people that, you know, you just keep asking. And I got my first opportunity with the gallery that represents me now by being their art handler, which mm. is quite interesting. And I've heard other people also having this experience with her, they will come in to work for a gallery as the art handler or like preparator mm -hmm. and, you know, put up the work. And at some point, maybe somebody asks you, well, what does your work look like? Or what's your background? Or you could just mention it to them. Hey, I'm also a painter. And if they see your work and they like it, they might give you a studio visit. And that's what happened with me is that they said, oh, we like your work. We'd like to come. And the gallery is in New York and Chelsea off 20th and 10th. But the gallery is originally from uh, Argentina. And so the curator from Argentina was coming to New York and it's like she would like to come see your studio. And I was like, absolutely. And so from there, I just did my absolute best to be very <laughs> professional well, yeah, and, right. you know, show, show my work and try to be less giggly and silly and just like, OK, no, this is like I'm very serious about this, you know, like um, and it worked out. It worked out. And. Um, the way that I get group shows is literally by networking and making friends with other artists because that's how that works. It's like you'll throw in people that you already know their work. You already know that they're like they're good for their work. You know, it's um, you basically you form a relationship with other people where they know that you're a serious artist, that you're actually making the work. You're actually um, capable of uh, producing for a show. Um, and when you show them, then they give you options opportunities so, yeah yeah okay the uh, yeah. and did you ever try to do this when you were in michigan i'm curious what the experience was like uh it, more midwest style uh oh, just, yeah. you know just because that is where i am and and with that i mean just with the difficulty that you i mean not difficulty i'm sorry with just with the difference in communities which every place does have their art community of some sort or creative community, whether it be just uh, even, you know, groups or whatever. But uh, um, basically what I'm getting at is when you were in uh, Michigan, was that when you were much younger or I mean, were you actually painting and putting stuff out there during that time? Yeah, it's a good question. So I was too young. I okay. left, we left Michigan when I was 10. Oh, okay. All right. I, was I wasn't sure. When, when you said you moved, I didn't know if it's like, and then I went to high school here and that's where I learned. That's what I was getting. Right. At. I should have asked that first. <laughs> no, no, because it's so funny. Like speaking of the Midwest, I had a curator, I'm sorry, a gallery from Puerto Rico come visit my studio. He was in New York oh, okay. and he's getting ready to show a big show in the Midwest oh. um, at one of the museums and also the Walker museum. Oh, okay. That I'm not, it wasn't there. I'm just sorry. I'm ADD. Like I just like, I would love to go to the Walker. Like that's just like, they have such great work. Like yeah. there's a lot of really great opportunities in the Midwest. And like, although I haven't personally um, had I've been in the works with something in the Midwest and also Chicago counts as a Midwest, right? Yes. Also, there's so many incredible artists and opportunities in Chicago. Yeah. Um, I was supposed to be in a show. I think it was in Chicago and then something happened where the curator left that museum. You know, things always, you know, things in the art world, you, right. I would also recommend. Wait, like, so you were going to travel everything. there or you were going to send your art there? I was going to send my art to a show. Okay. Wow. Which nice. Never came, All right. Came, yes, but it never happened. So, right. Um, but still, that that's pretty like, impressive. No, it's so cool. I, I've learned, I've learned that I should never tell people when someone offers me something until it happens. So that's a, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> that's my like warning for all you artists out there. Like, don't tell prematurely because then you'll just like be so embarrassed. Be like, actually, um, this didn't come to fruition. Like, just wait till it's actually shipped or like there's right. press releases. 
than tell people. I've done that so many times. I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing offered me this. And then something, you know, there's something that can happen, Well, which is okay. Yeah. You know, and, and you're going to love my next question then, because the way I usually like to, uh, the last question I usually like to ask is, what are some of the things that you're going to be doing that you'd like to tell people about? <laughs> oh, yes. So um, I do have, well, see, that's, see, but that's the thing. It's like, are they going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. How about this? So are there any do... <laughs> projects that you're, that you're very fascinated with or that you're really into right now? Like, you know, things maybe even you're working on like that, that maybe that'll be a little easier yeah. rather than going like my stuff might be in this or. Uh, I know. <laughs> tell me about some, yeah. What are some of the things you're working on right now that you're really excited about that you can tell people? Yeah, so I have I do have one thing that I can definitely plug that for sure has happened because I have okay. it in front okay. of me. So I was recently published as the cover artist for ah. this book called Diasporic Journeys. And it's interviews uh, with Puerto Rican writers in the United States. And is that the painting that right means, behind you that's on the cover? Yes. I <laughs> unveiled it for you because it was under nice. It was under um, some plastic so it's there for you to see as well um but yeah so i um how did you get that that, which yeah so i've been working with centro which is uh the center for puerto rican studies at hunter college at hunter uh, which is part of cuny okay so they do work um they do work around get you can have you can get a degree in puerto rican studies and learn history and about poets and activists um and so I've been in conversation with them and, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of like things that they do. And so they found out about my work and were interested in um, collaborating with me. And so I got this opportunity. And of course I said, yes, um, because I'm also like very proud of where I was born and where I come from and where my family is from. And it's a great um, segue into like my paintings and like, having multiple worlds in my head or having like multiple hmm. perspectives, which I really like to mesh together. Like, um, I don't keep them separate. It's like, I kind of bring, bring all my experiences together. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that is something I can for sure tell you about. <laughs> Cause you had it in your hand. It for real exists. I had it in my hand. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. Nice. And yeah. And supposedly I might be in a show possibly, in the future museum show who okay. knows if that'll happen um or if i'll be the one included um and then i was supposed to be in a chicago show which didn't happen i don't know if it's maybe still going to happen in the future okay i'm represented by this gallery and so you know i'm sorry could you say that again it, you you actually broke up right when you said the name of who you're represented uh, by if you want to say that see, one more maybe time that was like Maybe that was a god shot. Maybe like they're gonna break right. up with me next week or something. Maybe I should just listen. <laughs> like, oh, <God." laughs> okay, sorry. No, um, I think. Well, no, I don't think. Sorry, I am represented by Praxis Gallery, which is in Chelsea. It's okay. off twentieth and tenth, and so they, um, you know, are going to have a studio visit with me this summer, and maybe something will come of having another show there um, soon in the future. I've had one solo show with them in 2021 okay. um and so and i've been in a group show with them last year um so you know maybe i have enough new work i think to kind of start the conversation my work is quite large or can be quite large so i have to i just need time to make it and it's all right. oil and as you know oil painting just is quite a slow process of layering yeah. and drying and all that so it's not fast and if people wanted to look at your artwork right now, where would you suggest they can do that? Yeah. So I feel like Instagram is way more fun than my website, but okay. either one. <laughs> so my name is Estefania Velez. And then for Instagram, it's Estefania Velez Art, A-R-T. And then my website is also the same, EstefaniaVelezArt.com. Uh, my full name is Estefania Velez Rodriguez. If you Google me, things will come up. Maybe you'll like some of it. <laughs> if you don't, it's okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> so polite. So polite. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been really fun. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been really great. 